Are you ready to receive the power to change the world? Oh, wow. <laughs> Got one amen and a lot of laughing. Okay, that's, uh, well, you'll get another chance, so I'm warning you. You'll get another chance. That's what this passage from Acts is talking about. It says, but you were, this is the words of Jesus, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Judea, or in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. The power of the Holy Spirit will come upon these disciples. Well, what is God talking about? I mean, what is Jesus pointing to? When you look at the power of the Holy Spirit, you find all kinds of things that can happen. You hear of miraculous uh, events, you hear of healings, you hear of casting out of demons, you hear of profound teaching, you even hear of raising of the dead. And yet, I believe that what Jesus is talking about is, is an incredible power that's going to come upon these disciples and do something extraordinary. It's going to take a, a bunch of timid, unsure disciples and then turn them into faithful, discipling people who go to the ends of the earth to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ. That is an incredible power. And it is that power that, that is offered to us today. The same call to the early church is the same call that Jesus gives to the church today. The same Holy Spirit that He blessed the early church with is the same Holy Spirit that He has summoned upon us as well. So, where is our Jerusalem. I believe our Jerusalem is our homes and our community. Things that are the most intimate, the closest to us. Now, I'm going to draw upon a piece written by Barrett Johnson, who, who writes for this group called Imperfect Normal Families Only. Uh, that's, yeah, I, that's me. And uh, she talks about, in an article that I mentioned uh, quite a few sermons ago uh, that I told you I, uh, someone sent me called Raising Pagan Kids in a Christian Home. Do you remember that one? Um, and I promised you that I would read the article and get back to you. So I've now read the article. I'm getting back to you. And I'm going to share with you some of the insights from that because I believe they are dead on. And they're absolutely profound in understanding how we are empowered by God's Holy Spirit to minister in our Jerusalem, our homes. So, the question is this, do you teach your kids to be good or do you teach your kids that they will never be good without Christ's offer of grace? Two totally different things. There's a huge difference. The first one teaches kind of a moralism. The other one talks about a brokenness that is fundamentally addressed through the presence of Christ. The first one uh, creates some kind of self-righteousness. The second one leads to a life that realizes that Christ is the source of everything. Two totally different things. As kids grow up, the truth of the gospel, I think, can some, and as adults, the truth of the gospel can sometimes get lost where, where we believe that we need Jesus in all things because we end up living this thing called life, you know, it gets in the way, and, and, and we engage in life, and we just kind of get rolling along in life, and pretty soon we start developing this attitude of, I got this, God, I'm okay, I don't, I don't really need any help right here, right? And the more we teach our kids to be moralistic, to stand on their own two feet, the more we distance them from the, tre the presence of Christ. Now, it's good to, to stand on your own two feet, but it, when it comes to faith issues, are we really teaching them the truth? Is that the truth of faith? What we need is people who grasp the reality of why Jesus Christ came, who intimately know a God that will supply their every need. So how do we do this? Well, fundamentally, do we want to raise good kids or do we want to raise fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ? I mean, I want my kids to be good, but that really becomes a subset of, of fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. I really want my kids to be good in life, but I really want to spend eternity with my kids. And they can be as good as they want to in life, and that eternity is not going to be theirs. That eternity comes through only faith in Jesus Christ. 
Here's another way of looking at it. Parenting, this is going to shock some of you, parenting should be seen as discipling. Discipleship is parenting. Where you are, are being a disciple in your home, and at the same time, you are discipling your kids. You are discipling others in the family. When we do this, we, we, we literally are helping our kids, we're helping our family uh, to come to grips that everything we do should be according to God's agenda and should be understood as an act of redemption that Jesus Christ is bringing into the world. This literally transforms us, not as individuals, but transforms us as families as well. If we raise our kids just morally, we're missing a huge piece. And we're really raising our kids to be just like everybody else in the world with just a little Christianese morality sprinkled in. We want devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Christ did not come to make bad people act better. <laughs> Jesus Christ came to kill sin. This is the fundamental truth of Christianity. We can't by our own actions, by our own deeds, put ourselves in a pleasing relationship with God. We as Christians believe that through confession we are dying. We believe that Jesus' death on the cross was our death on the cross and that his resurrection becomes our resurrection. That Jesus Christ supplies us with the very fabric of all of our spiritual needs. Therefore, mean-spirited people that call themselves Christians, guys, you know them, you run into them, they are practicing some sort of self-righteousness. And Jesus spoke very harshly against that behavior. You know, it's common. You hear it all the time from parents of kids who have grown up and who have left the faith. The parents say, I don't know what happened. I brought them to church. Um, I had them engaged in the life of the church. And now they're not in church. And I don't understand. I don't know what happened. But what happened? was too many kids fell in love with the church. They fell in love with senior high ministry or junior high ministry. They, they fell in love with maybe the, the youth person. They fell in, in love with the church and its activities. They fell in love with the trips. They fell in love with the friendships. What they did not fall in love with was Jesus Christ. They did not enter into that intimate relationship with Jesus Christ so they understand that Jesus Christ is the source of their salvation, the source of all hope in their life. We got to help our kids to learn how to walk in a relationship with Jesus Christ, to live out Christ's love, his gracious attributes, to live as a Christian in every aspect of our life. And you know the best way to do that, best way to help our kids is by them watching us. By them watching us and they'll learn what Christianity looks like. They'll learn what that relationship with Christ means as, as we live it out, as it, as it shows an impact in our own life. And if you're not there, then they're not going to be there. It's just that simple. Perhaps one of the most fundamental things missing in a Christian home is the realization that our lives are no longer our own, that we've been brought at a price, and that as a result of that, we lay claim to this truth that he, Jesus Christ, died for me. And as a result, I will live for him. Because Christ died for me, I will live for him. This means helping your kids understand that they, they lay aside their own wants and desires in order to serve others, to, to bless others, to be there for others. Those that they, they live with, they work with, they study with, they play with means training your kids to see there's a lot more going on in the spiritual world than just what they can see with their own eyes. It's not about them. It's not about us. It's about Jesus and making his name great in the world, proclaiming to the world that he is our personal redeemer and savior. I'm Facebook friends with an eminent theologian and I want to share some of her words. Uh, it's Sarah Greer, Galen's wife. And 
Galen says, I'm humbled to be married to such a smart woman. This is what she wrote. Grace-based parents commit to bring their children up from their sin. Whereas legalistic parents put their children on a high standard and work overtime to keep them from falling down. Want me to read that again? It's pretty profound. Grace-based parents commit to bring their children up from their sin. Whereas a legalistic parent puts their children on a high standard and works overtime to keep them from falling down. It's the legalistic parents, guys, who show up at the principal's office when their kid's in trouble and says, my kid could never have done anything like that, and don't you say he could. Guess what? You're not helping your kid at all. You're, you're stroking your own pride, your own ego, and you're actually damaging your child. We told our kids very up front, you get trouble at school, you're going to be at trouble at home. You get beat down at school, you're going to be beat down at home. But we're going to love you and we're going to pick you up and show you gracious love. But you're not going to escape the result of your own action. We are called to witness in Judea. Our state, our nation would be our Judea. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote that. You're going to like a lot of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I'm reading one of his books, and so until I get done, you're going to get Dietrich Bonhoeffer quotes all over the place. So just get used to it. Bonhoeffer wrote, The infant church, that he's talking about the church in Acts 1 that the scripture was read about. The infant church was a visible community which all the world could see. The first disciples learned the truth of the saying that where their Lord is, there they must be also. And where they are, there the Lord will be until the world comes to an end. You understand that? As disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to understand that what we need to strive to be is in the presence of Christ. So where we, where we see Christ active, where we see God active, we need to join Him there, right? But at the same time, we have to understand that no matter where we are, no matter what relationship we're in, no matter who we're talking to, the Lord is present right there in the midst of that relationship. He has said, I will be with you to the end of time. I don't know about you, but knowing that Christ is there, present in the midst of conversations I might be having with someone or <clears throat> interactions I might be having with someone, changes how I perceive that person, changes how I view what's going on. Now, I got a, a video I want to play for you that gives you just kind of a glimpse of what God eyes might look like. You want to hit the video? Kid, every time I'm pulling out, he's right there. Man, and someone needs to talk to his parents if they're ever at home. What is up with the traffic today? It's always, every day, this intersection's always crowded. I hate pulling out of here. I need some of these dumb roads. Oh, there's. Oh. <laughs> okay, so I'm not even here. Right. Great lady. The princess of parking. Oh, sure. Take the spot. Way to be considerate. Oh, are you kidding me? Unbelievable. Oh. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, it's about time. Let's see, what do I want? Uh, yeah, could I add a cookie to that order? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, uh, no problem, only guy in the world. I'm sure you need your cookie. The world? Your oyster, and he's serving your cookies. Thanks, sir. Thank you so much. Uh huh. What can I get for you? Uh, yeah, I'll have a tall decaf macchiato. Yeah, sure, no problem. Three eighty-five. And uh, it might take a few minutes here. We've got quite a line, obviously. And thanks for your patience. Great. Yeah, <laughs> great. Great for me. Waiting again. Unbelievable. What? What is... What is that? 
What in the world? Oh. What? What am I supposed to do? How can I? How can I do anything about that? Can I even help with that? Oh. Your copy, sir. Oh. I can't. I can't take this anymore. I gotta get out of here. Hey, watch. Hey, buddy, come here. Do you get it? I don't know about you, but that guy is me way too much of my life, where I'm just kind of going through the motions of life, thinking about all the obstacles, people that are in my way, getting done what I think needs to get done. And all of a sudden you begin to look at people differently. You begin to look at each individual as a person with a soul. Now unfortunately they don't make glasses like that. So what we gotta do is we gotta spend time to understand, to listen, to hear, to come into contact with those individuals that are struggling in life. Witnessing in Samaria is witnessing to the unchurched, to the non-believers. Ken Hunter uh, tells this story. It's about a, a, a girl who was raised in the church, and she's at a church meeting, and she's sharing her view of discipleship. Jill took a deep breath, spoke a silent prayer from her heart, and asked God to direct her comments. She began a gentle approach to a monumental paradigm shift. I grew up in a great church with a wonderful pastor. I was in Sunday school and I had some awesome teachers and through it all I got the subtle notion that discipling was almost exclusively focused on content and teaching. But then, as I got a little older, I began to visit with my favorite uncle, David. He was an awesome Christian. We spent a lot of time together, one-on-one. -on -one. He talked about all sorts of things about his life. He was very transparent about his spiritual journey, and he let me know he was not perfect. And he told many what he called God stories, the way God worked in his life. He took me to the hospital with him several times, visiting relatives. I saw him pray, and eventually... He let me pray. He used to sit at the table in his garage. He'd always have something for me to drink and snacks to eat. And what I learned from him and practiced with him was a big part of my own discipleship development, right along with the formal teaching of the church. As I grew older, I realized that Christianity is perhaps more caught than taught. Rather than a program, I see Christianity as a movement through relationships. I realize that I learned in Sunday school what Jesus taught, but I learned from Uncle David how Jesus lived. I then realized that the Apostle Paul did the same thing with Timothy and others. Every time he went somewhere, he invited someone to come along. He did what Jesus did. Jesus said, Come, follow me. My Uncle David did that. Now I do that. This is my view of discipling. 
When we're talking about people outside the church, people who don't know faith, we don't beat them up. We don't force or argue people into the faith. We don't manipulate or guilt people into faith. You try those techniques, guess what? They're going to go the opposite direction. What we do is we love them and care for them. We may not agree with them, but we love them and care for them and demonstrate kindness to them and we speak truth in love. Jesus says that we are wit to witness to the ends of the earth. And this doesn't mean they have to travel to Myanmar or Uzbekistan, unless God's calling you to one of those places, then you better go. What it means is we are disciples, followers of Christ, everywhere. In every situation, in every encounter, we are representing Jesus Christ. Matthew 28, 19, Jesus says these words, and I'm going to give you Tyler's translation because I've been playing around with this one. While you are coming and going, literally all the time, disciple all nations. While baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, while teaching them to obey all I've commanded you, and look here, pay attention, Jesus says, I will be with you always to the end of the age. There's a movie out called The Son of God. How many of you have seen it? I can't see hands. A few of you, right? I haven't seen it yet. Um, my wife and I, were going to go see it together. And, uh, but people who have seen it have said two things. Number one, it goes really fast. So fasten your seatbelt because it covers the life of Jesus really quickly. Secondly, a phrase that really hits them big time and is memorable from the movie. And, and this is going to be a phrase you're going to recognize. When one of Jesus' disciples asks him, what are we going to do? Jesus says, we're going to change the world. That's what the book of Acts is about. That was the fundamental call to the church. That's why the Holy Spirit was given to the church to literally change the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. So are you ready? I'm going to ask you again. Are you ready to receive power to change the world? Oh, that's, that's a very polite Lutheran response. I'll give you this week to work on it, okay? The Lord is calling you guys to outlive your life. The Lord is calling you to live a life that is emblematic of being a disciple of Jesus Christ, empowered by God's Holy Spirit to do that very thing. In his holy and precious name, amen.